I think that, you know, in, in taking this, uh, this thing, we always start with the question, why? Why are we discussing this? Why are we spending, you know, uh, Saturday afternoon, you know, maybe we one watch the football and all the rest of it. Why are we discussing this particular uh, issue? And, of course, the issue of council cuts is really a live one, and it's been a live one because of this question of austerity, because austerity that is faced in the National Health Service and education and is faced by uh, councils. And Liverpool City Council in the recent period has had 58% of, of, its, of its budget cut from central government. Now, you probably don't know that. It might be the first time you've heard of that. And that's because Liverpool City Council, as its present constituted, is not campaigning, is managing those cuts, is following a policy of really carrying out those cuts and kind of managing them in, uh, in, the, in the kindest way that they feel is possible. Back in the 80s, every single person in the country knew that Liverpool City Council was, was under attack from the Tory government because there was a campaign that started, started in Liverpool, but it, but it went national and it became a national campaign. And, uh, you know, we're, we're to discuss that particular struggle and how we fought the cuts in the, uh, in the 1980s. But in talking about the 1980s, we have to go back a little bit further in, into history of how this came about. Because the first part I want to talk about how we came to the day, the day of um, fighting the cuts. And this is a Marxist school, so we need to talk about the role of Marxists in that struggle. And a very important role of Marxists, who were organised in the 1980s uh, around the newspaper Militant. And Militant was an organisation that was in the Labour Party, that was working class in the Labour Party. We accused, obviously there was this weird adventurism. But I, you know, I'm, a, I'm the, a, a worker. My, my father was a factory worker, my mother was a, a shop worker. As far as I'm concerned, the Labour Party is my party. It's more my party than the careerists like Blair, the careerists who, who took over the Labour Party to run it in their own interests. And certainly more my Labour Party than the party of, uh, of carpetbaggers like Luciana Berger, who I'm glad to say now is no longer a member of the party. <laughs> but, so, the Marxists in the 1950s basically joined the Labour Party but they joined it, there's two schools of thought. The majority of those Marxists who joined the Labour Party believed that what they should do is just support the left wing of the Labour Party, support the left, that time who were the Bevanites, followers of, of Nye Bevan, and basically keep their heads down as far as being Marxists was concerned and just say we're left wingers. There was another group of Marxists who joined the Labour Party, the minority, and around about 30 uh, comrades and all, Around about 20 organised in Liverpool, but 20 organised in London, or crucially over about 10 in Liverpool. And those Marxists, around the, uh, uh, led by and, and uh, uh, Ted Grant, actually believed that yes, they should be in the Labour Party, yes, they should support the left against the right, just as we should support Jeremy Corbyn against the, uh, the right wing, but also, crucially, didn't believe in keeping their heads down as far as the ideas of Marxism was concerned. That they actually said that the, the solutions are basically around the Marxist programme, is around about the nationalisation of the commanding heights of the economy, and about workers' control of industry, and all the rest of it. And we see the parallel today with our campaign on Labour for Clause 4. And then, that small group, despite being small, that, that, that want some of the <coughs> crucial people in that, where uh, people who were, uh, one family in fact, the Dean family, uh, with three brothers, Arthur, Brian and, uh, and Jimmy Dean, and the mother who was called Gertie. And those were crucial, a crucial support for the ideas of Marxism in Liverpool. And what they did, they recruited some to, uh, young people, and they basically could just put out Marxist propaganda. And when I joined the Labour Party, uh, I went along to a Labour Party Young Socialist meeting. We passed a, a, a resolution at that meeting, quite a long resolution. I, I can't remember what the subject was, but we ended up by calling for the nationalisation of the Command and Knights of the Economy for the top 200 monopolies. And I went to the, went to the Secretary of the Constituency and said, oh, that's a Walton resolution. Wal Walton is a, an area of Liverpool. That's a Walton resolution. So I said, what, what do you mean, Walton? It's from Garston, the Young Socialists, Liverpool Garston Young Socialists. He said, no, no, it's like... These, we always get these motions come through from people in Walton talking about uh, nationalisation, talking about that, 
And what he really meant was those were, those were motions, they were resolutions, were one way that the Marxists in Liverpool were putting forward the programme in, in the Labour Party, one way of actually putting through. Mo model motions, if you like, there's some in, in socialist appeal that are very good, and those are the things that, you know, really st stamp the ideas. Also, uh, at the time, it should be said, there was a youth paper called Rally, which was read all about the Labour League of Youth at, at the time, and that was a, a, was a, a, a crucial organiser for, for the Marxists in, uh, in the Labour Party. So why do I make that, uh, make that distinction between those two schools of thought? Basically, I'll we'll just follow the left wing, or we'll put forward a, 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 a distinct <coughs> Marxist programme. But that's crucial to the battle, and you'll see that that's crucial to the battle later on within Liverpool and the debate around that battle. <coughs> but in terms of Liverpool itself, a couple of things happened in the... We could bring it up to the, the 1970s. And a couple of things happened in the 1970s. One is the Tory government decided to attack the working class and attack people who were council house uh, tenants. And, uh, and the act they brought through was called the Housing Finance Act. And this enormously increased the, the rents that were being paid by working class people as council <coughs> tenants. And one of the reactions to this was that uh, Kirby, which is a town just to the north and the east of Liverpool, that in Kirby, the, way, the, the, the council tenants there decided enough was enough. They were living, and I've just come from Tasha's uh, uh, discussion on the conditions of the, of the working class. I'd advise you all, I've, I've shared uh, a film on, on, the, on the event page, and I'd advise you all, to, if you haven't looked at it, to look at it. Because you saw there the absolute deprivation in that area of Kirby, of living in flats, with raw sewage literally running uh, through, through the bottom of those flats and in, into the streets. And those people said, no, we're not having it, we're going on rent strike. And they led a rent strike, working class rent strike, uh, within that area. And I say that because this idea of, of you know, uh, uh, breaking the law and, of, and of, of fighting back against the system, people portray Marxism as some kind of alien, uh, alien beings, we're all aliens, we all just come and land amongst the working class, and then we disseminate our ideas, subversive ideas. But basically the working class knows that when it comes to the limit, when it comes to a choice between having a decent conditions and breaking the so-called laws of the capitalist state, they know what side they're on. They know that they have to pick their families first and they have to pick their living conditions first before obeying the law. That it breaks out uh, and it's broken out many times over our history. And one of those times was that, uh, was that rent strike in Kirby. Because the council there decided they were going to, imp despite the fact it was a Labour council, was going to implement the Tory law. Apart from one honourable exception, one councillor, who interestingly enough that later became one of the Labour uh, councillors in Liverpool. And at the same time, was the, the, a Labour council did stand up and a Labour council did fight back. And that Labour council was the Clay Cross Council. We decided that uh, they decided there was not going to the Clay Cross Labour Party. We are not going to implement this Tory law, and they actually called upon other uh, people to support them. There was a conference called that said, "No, we're not going to go along with this Tory law." But Clay Cross itself was left isolated, and two waves, two sets of councillors, were stood up for the people that they would represent, that, that they were there to represent. And, and they were surcharged. And what, uh, uh, all comrades will, will know of Dennis Skinner, but Dennis Skinner's family was actually involved in that. In Liverpool, the same struggle saw a split, a three-way split on the council, with the left wing deciding that they weren't going to implement it, but with the right wing implementing that. And those right wingers, and this is an interesting parallel, those right wingers, when I joined the Labour Party in 1977, there was a, the word that went round, the dirtiest word you could hear in Liverpool Labour Party was implementer. And every time a councillor came up, it would implement the House and Finance Act. And it went through because it was an alliance between the right wing of the Labour Party and the Tories on the council, that we should deselect the implementers. We should deselect those councillors who implemented the, uh, the House and Finance Act. But also at the time in Liverpool, we saw the crisis, the real crisis of capitalism. I, I lived at the time, <coughs> in, in the late 70s, 
in, in, a, in a district of Liverpool called Speak, which is an industrial estate and a working class housing estate. And on that estate, I, no, no, you know, in terms of the ideas of Marxism, every day, well, periodically I would go out, go out of my house and see the crisis of overproduction. Because we had the Ford's Halewood plant and we saw cars stacked up all over the estate. Every little bit of green on our house and estate was taken up by cars that Ford's couldn't sell. I also saw what Ted Grant termed as the special crisis of British capitalism. In the fact, there was a factory there called Dunlops which made tyres. And in, 19, uh, in 1979, that factory closed. But the equipment, in 1979, the equipment in that factory dated back to 1911. And I, I went into that factory as a photographer working for a, for a local paper called the Speak Press as a trainee and took a photograph of a giant mould with a rust hole in it, probably the height of this, height of this room. This, this was the crisis of British capitalism that was throwing, uh, which was happening before the advent of Thatcher. And I think that's important as Marxists to realise that. That it wasn't just Thatcher had this idea of attacking the working class. She was taking that logic, and the logic for her system was, was that the workers must pay for the crisis of, of, of capitalism. And that led to thousands of workers being thrown out of work in Liverpool. It led, it led to, the, to the real uh, uh, acceleration of, uh, of mass unemployment that we saw within our city. And it also meant that the council, and, and, the, and the Liverpool City Council, became the major employer Within, within, within Liverpool. So we were faced, and as part of that battle, obviously Thatcher came to power in 1979, and one of the things she, she said is working class people must pay. There must be an, you know, an austerity programme, although we didn't call it that at the time, of Tory cuts against, against, working, class, uh, against working class people. What also happened, and it must be said, is that the council at that time was in the hands, but through a lot of the, the early, uh, late 70s and early 80s, the council started to be in the hands of the Liberal Party, now part of the Liberal Democrats. And the Liberal Party arose and became very popular because of the right wing of the Labour Party. The right wing of the Labour Party, which ignored, which, which ignored the... Uh, Aspirations ignored the needs of the working class in Liverpool. That, and that, that right wing of the Labour Party, that neglect from that right wing of the Labour Party led to Liberal councillors being elected, uh, in particular in the wards which are, are surround Liverpool city centre. Because they said, we've got, you know, we've got councillors who we never see, they're not doing anything for the area. You've got an area around Edge Hill which had some of the worst housing in Western Europe, and yet the council. Uh, councillors were not doing anything for it. And just as an indication of how out of touch they were, in this constituency that had the worst housing outside uh, Western Europe, there was a, a, a by-election campaign. The Edgehill by-election just took place uh, in 1978. And that by-election campaign, in that, in, in that campaign, the Liberal upsurge reached its peak. They stood a, councillor, uh, a candidate, David Alton, and this, and this candidate, everybody said, well, David Alton supports us. Within that constituency, every one but every Labour councillor had been uh, defeated at the ballot box apart from one. And then we had this meeting in which I was the young socialist speaker. Uh, there was the candidate and there was this councillor who was called Sir Harry Livermore. And Sir Harry gets up and talks to the people in the room, which fortunately was only two people, such was, such was the, the degeneration of the Labour Party in Liverpool at that time, and said to them, this election is not about housing, this election is not about the state of the streets or the state of your, your uh, you know, council services, this election is about bigger things like foreign policy. And of course that went down like, like a lead balloon, and that went down as to show that the Labour Party had become totally out of touch. But, as you can see, there was an upsurge within the Labour Party of the left wing of the Labour Party and also of the Marxists who were in the Labour Party. And saying we have to change and this, this Labour Party has to, has to uh, change. And there was a debate between us about how we take on the Tory cuts. And this is where we come to this distinction between what is a left programme and what is a Marxist programme. And the distinction was this, that the left wing said, well, look at it. We're having cuts, 
but, and this is a national uh, picture as well. We've got cuts, so what we've got to do is manage them in the best way we can for the poorest sections of society. And then what we need to do, the rates, which, which just to explain, the, 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 it was in the council tax then. The council tax was uh, 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 preceded by the poll tax, which was preceded by uh, the rates, which was based upon what was called the rateable value of your property. And the rateable value of your, of your house or your property then determined how much money you paid towards the council. And that was your, that was your rates. And that was one of the places where the, where the council got money. The other place where the council got money was, was the rate support grant. And the rate support grant was the money that we got, they got from the central government. Anyway, so the idea of these lefts was, well, the people who pay the most rates are the, are the better off within society. And so therefore, if we put the rates up, and we, and we increase the rates by higher than inflation, we'll be able to compensate for these cuts without affecting really the poorest people within society. And so this had a certain, and, and of course, this idea has come up again with, with comrade Chris Williamson, uh, <coughs> MP, who has brought this particular idea up. And whilst again, you know, Chris Williamson should be absolutely, uh, completely defended against the right wing of the Labour Party, I'm afraid on this particular position, you know, his, his, his position is wrong. Because we saw that the, the Marxist view and the criticism of that is that the rates were nothing but a pay cut. And that by making that, by, by increasing the rates further than inflation, what you, were doing is what you were doing is making a pay cut. And what it also meant is that if you look at it as a national strategy of fighting the cuts, because in general the poorest councils, the Labour councils are the poorest councils, and they would have, uh, the, the rates, though they were, uh, you know, if you look at council tax, for instance, the council tax for uh, a low end of the property in Liverpool is higher than in some of the Tory shires, some of the Tory uh, boroughs down south. And the reason for that is because there's more of those poorer dwellings, so in other words, the council has to depend upon the poorest end anyway and increase the rates on those areas. So we said it was a pay cut, and we said what we're doing is, all, all we would be doing is deciding who, which section of the working class should be attacked by the ruling class, and which section of the working class should lose. So the strategy put forward by the Marxists in the Labour Party, by militants, was that what we should do is fight the government to, to retain the cuts to the, to the rate support grant, because that was what was being cut by the Thatcher government that we should retain those cuts. And the strategy that was developed was one of a deficit budget, of basically setting a budget where on the one side, and, and the nearest thing I think we can come to now is some, some uh, activists are talking about a needs budget. So we look at the needs of the community. And this is what Liverpool City Council did. They looked at the need, they looked at the need for decent housing, they looked at the needs for, uh, 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 you know, for jobs and so on within the communities and said this is going to cost this amount of money and then we looked at, you know, we looked at where that money was going to come from and we did not want to increase the rates by more than inflation so it would leave a gap, so it would be a deficit budget because it would leave this particular gap uh, between what was coming in and what we needed to spend and what we were committed to spend. But we weren't, as in most deficit budgets, going to borrow that from the banks. What we were going to do was we were going to say that that is the money that we're going to fight the government for. And when we, when we came, first came to that campaign, that, that that particular sum of money was £30 million. Uh, pound. But we were quite clear that, that such a campaign, such a policy, was not just a question of, of passing... Uh, passing this in the council chamber, that we needed a mass campaign to support this policy. We needed to take this out to the working class to win not only the Labour Party to this policy, but win the working class in, in Liverpool to this policy as a mass campaign. And we also needed to win the support of the council workers, uh, uh, workers on the city council. Now, the way in 1982, while we were discussing this and debating this, and, and I've got to say as well, as I make, make a 
crucial points because the, the body that was debating this was known as the District Labour Party. It was a democratic body elected by, by, by wards, by the Labour Party members throughout the city, by the trade unions throughout the city and a number of other organisations. But it was a democratic body and one of the things that the left did when they took control of that body is to say they decide on, on the councillors and who should get a councillor, become a council on the panel. And what they did was said, basically one of the crucial questions for a councillor was, who decides the policy for the Labour Council? And the answer that those, those, people, those respective councillors had to give was the district Labour Party. The rank and file decide the policies, not the Labour group, not the people who are the councillors decide the policies. So that was crucial. So that's where the debate took place. And in fact, that debate was won uh, for, for the ideas of Marxism. And it was won partly through force of arguments and partly through the, the, the comrades uh, winning those discussions. But it was also won because in 1980, Labour did take control of Liverpool City Council. And the, uh, under the policy of the lefts, put the rates up by 50%. So we saw that as a pay cut. And the result of that is that Labour was absolutely defeated at the, at, the, at the next election. The Liberals came in with a policy of cuts and so on. So it was a self-defeating, that particular policy was a self-defeating policy, particularly within Liverpool. So Labour was out of office in 1980 after it passed that, uh, that rate increase. And within Liverpool, there were community campaigns, campaigning on, on the issues. It was not just the question of, of the Labour Party that was campaigning, but there were many community. Two community campaigns in particular. One around a school, Croxteth Comprehensive School in the north of Liverpool, who occupied, the, 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 the stu school students and the teachers there occupied the school to stop the Liberals closing it. Because the Liberals had a policy of closing schools in working class areas in order for, for, to, to rationalise the education within the city. And the other movement, which is a movement that I was involved in, because I was, uh, I was living in the flats there, was a movement called the Nedley Flat Dwellers. Because, because when we're talking about housing and, and council dwellings, which will come on to, into what we, we did in a minute, that, uh, yes, council, council dwellings, if you like, were built during the 1960s and the 19. 70s and so on, but a good number of them were actually flats, were, were, were high-rise flats and also were tenement flats. And in, in Netherley we had these tenement flats where you could walk from one end of the estate to the other end of the estate and never, never touch earth because you walked along these landings uh, themselves. And I lived in one of these flats, you had to go in, you had to go down these stairs as if you were going down into a cell to get down to your flat. Uh, and so on, and they were really uh, gruesome, especially when you were talking about raising children in those flats, because either the children would have to play out on the landing, or they'd play a good, a good distance away from your front door. So they were, they were a gruesome prison-like block. They looked like a kind of uh, science fiction prison that you would get uh, on one of these uh, things, probably aliens or whatever it is. Uh, anyway, so, so, the, so the people there decided they were going to campaign against this. And one of, the, one of the boosts that they got was that the councillor who was elected, and this one mentioned a few names, was Derek Hatton was elected as a councillor in Nedley, who comrades may have heard of. And Derek supported this campaign of the flat dwellers, and the flat dwellers had a key demand, is that they wanted houses. And I went on, on some of the uh, campaigns with them, some of the lobbies of the council, and used to sing a song about wanting a house with a garden. They wanted their children to be brought up in decent conditions. And what, the, what this meant was that when Liverpool City Council came into power, that we, did, we built 4,800 houses and bungalows. They didn't build flats, they didn't build masonettes, they didn't build any of these other tenement blocks. They were houses. And they were houses because those, that was the demand of the working class within Liverpool. And it shows that when we're, it's not just a question of resources. It's not just a question of fighting, of a council fighting for those resources. It's a question of the democratic input of the working class 
and of the demands of, of working class people who are directly involved and whether the council listens to those particular, to those particular demands. And when you look at the, the, you know, uh, it, the council that was elected, the legacy of that council, which was, a, which was a council, as I said, following a revolutionary course of action, of taking on the government, of taking on the, the power within society, of fighting the power within, within Britain. That yes, it was a revolutionary council, but by being revolutionary, it came, came to some <coughs> massive reforms for working class people. 4,800 houses and bungalows built, of 7,400 houses and flats improved during that time. And, of, and literally something like 12,000 flats, either, either uh, flats, bungalows, tenement blocks, demolished, to, and, and, the, and those working conditions actually improved. And on the employment side, the Liberals, my, uh, we used to have discussions as a council worker, with, with my colleagues, but I had one colleague <coughs> who was not involved in the Labour Party but absolutely supported the council and the, way, the reason she supported the council was because the workers on the council under the Liberals were employed on 47 week contracts, then finished up for five weeks and then taken on again for another 47 weeks. Because at that particular time the employment protection was 12 months so they never acquired employment protection uh, John and they could just be finished off uh, things and, they, and there was a few hundred of those workers and when Labour was elected in 1983 Labour was elected into, into, uh, into the council with, the, with this programme that the Liberals were looking at a cut budget of cutting around about a thousand jobs from Liverpool City Council because of the Tory cuts Cutting those thousand jobs in a city that had already had thousands of redundancies, thousands upon thousands of redundancies from industry um, uh, it's, itself. Labour came in, the first thing they did when they came in they, uh, was to stop these temporary contracts, to save the thousand jobs and then have a programme of taking on a thousand more. So through the programme there's two thousand uh, extra workers working in, uh, in, uh, in Liverpool City Council and would have been if Labour had, had lost. So that was a, a reform that, that we won by, by taking a revolutionary uh, programme. But also the council house building programme itself employed ten, around 10,000 uh, workers, building workers at its height. That uh, UCAT, which was the trade union that covered uh, uh, construction workers, reported uh, in 1985 that they didn't have an unemployed joiner on the books because all, they were all employed building council houses in Liverpool, decent council houses, uh, uh, you know, I have to say. So we then come to, so this, this programme has come in, and in 1984, <coughs> yes, we had to get that, we got the trade unions on side, we built the mass campaign on, on the working house council estates, where on the working class council estates we had meetings of 200 and of 300, and in 19, March 29th, 1984, because I've looked at the chronology, uh, there, was a, there was a mass demonstration of 50,000 on the streets of Liverpool, and the pictures are there online uh, to prove it. That mass demonstration was really the high point, uh, uh, you know, the high point in 1984 of that. And, and, and through that council, and I won't go in, into details how it got through, there was a little bit of trickery, we managed to get through at Labour re-elected in 1984 on that programme with, it, with an increased uh, uh, majority and a programme of fighting the Tories. Well in 1984 the Tories had another problem which they're discussing downstairs, the miners' strike. And the fight of Liverpool City Council was something that they didn't want to do. So they saw that we were determined and they actually uh, folded uh, to the extent that they provided not 30 million but 20 million pounds uh, extra money to Liverpool City Council and we saw it as a partial victory and we saw it as a partial victory that we had to take back to the people of Liverpool and back to the, back to the movement and that was a uh, question in 1984. In 1985 we then come, uh, the councils around the country when I was talking about rate, uh, rates was that that was our programme of not putting the rates up if we could help it of, of, uh, of taking on the government, but around the country the left-wing councils were raising the rates. And these are councils led by people like David Blunkett, 
in Sheffield. Uh, uh, Ken Livingston, who I believe is talking around the corner in Greater L London Council, and he's, he's around the corner at 7 o'clock. Um, and Margaret Hodge in Islington, that great sterling fighter for the movement. And those, those councils were raising the, raising the rates, and, the, and I've got the figures there, by 38% they wanted to raise a 40% year-on-year raising rates in order to compensate for the Tories. Now the Tories of course said, well hang on a minute, here's a vote winner for us. We'll cap those rates, we'll stop them raising the rates so much, these, these, these councils, and, and we'll, we'll put this in. So there was a campaign, they decided then to have a campaign against rate capping. And we decided in Liverpool that we would join in this campaign, and this would be a national campaign. And I, I think that's important to say, because a lot of people now in the movement say, oh, Liverpool was isolated, it was like the charge of the Light Brigade, they went out, and they had no idea what they were doing, and they were isolated from the rest of the movement around the country. It's absolutely not true. We joined in a campaign against the rate capping. And the ironic thing about that is that the tactic that that campaign adopted was not our tactic. It was not the tactic of making a deficit budget. The tactic was, was to say, we're not going to set a budget until this is settled. We're, going to have no, you know, we're not setting a budget. So we said, okay, we don't like, we argued our case, but we went along with that particular uh, tactic. And the ironic thing is that when the councillors came to be surcharged, they were not surcharged for setting a deficit budget, they were not, which, which they eventually did. They were not surcharged for our own tactics, they were surcharged because of the tactics of David Blunkett, Margaret Hodge, Ken Livingston and, and the rest of them, who unfortunately during the course of that campaign left the field of battle. One by one they went down. And the first one to go down was Comrade Livingston and, it was the, and the Greater London Council. It was the first one to go down and the, the honourable exception on the Greater London Council was John Macdonald who said no we should stick with Liverpool and also we should stick with the Council Lambeth in London in fighting these particular uh, cuts. But if we go back to uh, Liverpool that we, that one, of the, one of the problems that we had was also, obviously we came under attack from the, from the leadership of the Labour Party, who had this policy of what they called a dented shield. And basically a dented shield meant manage the cuts. Well, as far as I can see, the only way, way you get a, a shield dented is by actually engaging in a battle. They didn't even want to engage in the battle. So why it was called a dented shield, you know, a campaign, uh, you know, was beyond me. So they said that, and of course, you know, comrades can see the video of Neil Kinnock uh, attacking Liverpool City Council and the total nonsense of talking about going around giving out redundancy notices, none of which were enacted. None of those redundancy notices were enacted. Uh, but of, of doing that to, merely to attack the council and, and all the rest of it. And out of that, they turned around to the Liverpool City Council and said, you've got to solve the situation in our, in our way. And they produced a report with the support of the lefts around the party who had, who had previously been with us in the battle and then deserted us. And saying, in this report, the Stone Rock Frost report, they basically said, you've got to put the rates up by another 15% on top of the 9%. And basically, you've got to cut the cost, your staffing costs, and that meant, <coughs> as we calculated, put the rates up as well, make, make uh, further cuts on the council, but you've also got to get rid of a thousand council workers. And this policy was supported by the leadership of all of the major trade unions with members on the council. The, general, the GMB, the Transport and General, which is now Unite, and, uh, and NALGO, which is now part of Unison. Those union leaders, we had the spectacle of trade union leaders going into an employer saying, make my members redundant, and the employer saying, no, we're not going to make your members redundant. This, that was the, the, the level of the leadership of the trade union movements. And of course, we saw it, no doubt they're discussing it downstairs about that trade union movement let down the miners, and, and the trade union movement did similar to any battle during the 1980s of just wait until there's a Labour government. And when Neil Kinnock made his attack on Liverpool, some right-wing, 
a right-wing MP came out and said, Neil Kinnock's just won the next general election. <laughs> well, in actual fact, he lost the next two general elections and then retired to ignominy uh, after that. So it didn't win in the election. In fact, it divided the movement and it divi divided uh, you know, you know, that particular thing. So we didn't adopt the Stone Frost report. We had the idea, but the, but the fact that the trade union leaders were, 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 were against the council had an effect upon the trade on the on the trade union leaders within the council and those trade union leaders within the council started one by one trade unions uh, the the lecturers union the teachers union uh, nalgo which was the admin union started to desert the cause of the of the city council and because of that in in 1985 faced with on our own if you like and isolated as we then were not by design but by betrayal I have to say then we decided that we had to retreat but the one we retreated we didn't retreat by making people unemployed we didn't retreat by stopping building council houses we retreated by borrowing money from the banks so so our idea is, is you know was a Marxist program first and the thing that we regarded as a retreat as a defeat was Keynesian economics <laughs> basically when you think about it we borrowed money from the banks and we regarded that as a defeat. People be, some people now regard that as a policy. We regarded that as a defeat. But we maintained, and the fact of the matter, and the facts and the figures which I haven't got time to go into now, show that in election after election, that, that, that in the last mayoral election in Liverpool, Joe Anderson, the, the current mayor of Liverpool, and former paper sale, former, uh, former buyer of the militants off, off yours truly, um, gained about 50,000 votes as, as mayor of Liverpool. At the height of the struggle, we were getting 90,000 votes in Liverpool. 90,000 votes for the council and an increase in the votes for, for, uh, for the MPs in Liverpool, Labour MPs, who at that time stood with the council uh, 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 itself. So there was a, there was a, a, a great uh, struggle there. And those councillors who were involved in that struggle really needed to be commended. The 49 councillors, 47 who were surcharged because two councillors uh, uh, died during that struggle, that those, uh, those councillors need to be commended. And the interesting thing about those councillors is they, that, yes, the millet was very important on that council, but we also had councillors who were on the right wing of the party. And the reason, the, the reason why they supported the policy was is because as Marxists we did things the right way. We won the policies through the party. We won the policies through the democratic uh, structures of the party, through the District Labour Party, and we won that policy. And we also on the council reminded people, as a caucus if you like, reminded people, of, reminded the councillors of that, of that policy. So we need to come down to, as I'm just being told to, uh, to sum up, and obviously, you know, we could have a whole day school on this, and Lily knows I could go on for hours about this. Uh, I could, uh, you know, rat drone on for hours about Liverpool and, uh, you know, my life in the 80s and so on and what happened. But, you know, we have to draw this to a conclusion. Now, I saw an interview with Derek Hatton, who was a leading member of that uh, campaign, and he says, what he said was, well, that was then and this is now. That was then, and you know, those were policies that suited the 1980s, but they're not policies that suit uh, today. Well, we fundamentally disagree with that, because the problems are the same, if not worse, now. The problems that those companies that were at uh, Tasha's session in the last about the conditions of the, of the working class will know that the, working, that the working and the living conditions of working class people have got worse, if anything, since the 1980s. That instead of going in the direction of getting better, they're in the direction of getting worse. So what we need to see and what we should demand is that Labour councils do take a stand. Do follow the example of Liverpool. Unashamedly, arm yourselves with the facts, with the figures of what happened then. Arm yourself with those facts and figures and go, to those, go, to, go into those Labour parties and say, but for the fact that the national campaign the national campaign in 1985 was betrayed by the leadership of the movement, then we would have seen Thatcher put at an end earlier. We would have seen the council, uh, council services protected and we would have seen houses built 
through, through, uh, uh, more, more houses built. But we need to protect it now because the services that are being affected are, are, the, are the social care services. Is, uh, councils are talking about building affordable houses. Affordable to who, you may ask. Affordable houses when they should be building council houses for the needs of, the, of those communities. We need these policies now more uh, than ever. We need these policies today the same as we needed them in the 1980s. And if we can build this and proud record of our movement, of our Marxist movement that goes back through the 80s, will be uh, are the comrades who can put that forward throughout the Labour Party and the Labour and Trade Union movement. Thank you.